Today, I thought we could go back to basics, talk about work holding in the lathe, potentially answering a popular question about which lathe chucks to get and why. I'm doing this video for two reasons. First, the underlying principle of choosing a chuck or work holding in general affects the quality of your work and is fundamentally important to understand in machining. Second, it's a really easy video for me to make. For those of you who've been doing this for a while, this video might quite frankly drive you crazy but i don't know you so it's a risk i'm willing to take these are the lathe chucks that i own we'll talk about all of them briefly but the concept behind this discussion extends to all work holding in general my three jaw chuck which would go about here is still installed on my lathe it's probably the most popular and the one you're likely to have on yours so give me a minute and i'll go and grab it If I were stranded on a desert island and could only have one thing, without a doubt, it'd be the four jaw chuck. I have a complicated relationship with three jaw chucks and in principle, much prefer their four jaw counterparts. With that said, the four jaw, other than maybe the faceplate, is probably the one that spends the least amount of time on the spindle. For the work that I do, the three jaw, or maybe the collet chuck, are what see the most use. The four jaw really only comes out when I need it, say for square work. But that lazy and devil may care attitude only comes after you fully understand the implications of choosing a work holding device, of choosing a chuck. So then why would my first pick be the four jaw? Well, because it's the responsible choice. It's enlightened. It's sort of like asking if a poor, honest, and humble life is better than being rich and famous. <laughs> when you go in for that machinist's job interview and they ask you what your favorite chuck is, and trust me, they will ask you what your favorite chuck is probably before even asking your name, you should say four jaw. The more hardcore answer might be faceplate or turning between centers. That's totally legit. But then you might run the risk of being put in that weirdo category. The option that's missing in this work holding lineup is the center, as in working between centers. But in order to make sense of all of this stuff, we need to go back and start at the lathe. Go and take a look at the spindle. Now, do you need all of this stuff for your lathe? Absolutely. It depends. Other than the small four jaw chuck and the faceplate, I got all of the rest of this stuff with the lathe, so I never really had to make that decision. But we'll go through all of this stuff one at a time, as I mentioned, and then you can decide for yourself if it's worth investing in additional work holding for your lathe and the kind of work you do. This is the lathe spindle. Well, technically it's the spindle nose. The spindle runs through the entire headstock. And the part that sticks out, the part you'd attach your work to, is the spindle nose. It's the business end. In my case, my lathe uses an American L0 spindle. That's a long taper, size zero, has a key, and a captive nut. All that serves to align, hold, and drive the trucks. Yours will likely look different, and that's totally normal. They all look different, it's perfectly natural. These days, I think they tend to use shorter tapers and cam lock pins, but what do I know? I'm no lathologist. The accuracy of your lathe, or consequently that of your work, in large part depend on the accuracy of your spindle, or the condition and quality of it. If your bearings are shot, and the spindle has two inches of play, well, it's gonna be a challenge to make good parts. Okay. I just went through this big long-winded thing with hand-waving, pipe cleaners, and sock puppets to explain the geometric relationships here, but I cut it all out. So ignore that part you didn't see. Let's just get down to brass tacks and simply demonstrate what the potential issues are with lathe chucks. If you were paying attention, I said the buck starts here with the spindle nose. A little oversimplified maybe, but let's say that the accuracy of the spindle nose dictates how accurate your parts can be. Assuming, of course, that the rest of your lathe, your ways, your carriage, tool post, for example, are all in decent working order. But that's a different video. Ideally, you'd put your work right in your spindle nose and go to town. But how you decide to attach your work to your spindle nose will have an impact on the quality of work you'll be doing. So we need some way to safely and accurately attach our work. We need a chuck. And therein lies the catch. That is sort of the whole point of this video. Anything you put between your spindle and your work, quite frankly, is a compromise. And you should be aware of what compromises you're making when you select a chuck. Before I get any further here, let me just mention the outlier. Working between centers. Your lathe will have two tapers. An external taper and an internal taper in the spindle bore. If you put a center in your lathe, in theory, you're conserving the accuracy of your spindle. You're not really making the compromises we just talked about a moment ago. Assuming, of course, your center isn't crooked or, you know, maybe in better shape than mine. 
But to work between centers, you'll need centers on your work. Something like these. This happens to be a mandrel, but it's the same concept. You'll also need a lathe dog of some kind to drive it. That center can't spin your work. Something like this. And of course, some sort of faceplate or drive plate to drive your dog. Something to engage this dog leg that actually spins the work so you can cut it. There are plenty of videos about working between centers, so I won't get into that here. Let's start with what is likely the most popular option, the three jaw chuck. Now all chucks interface to the spindle with a back plate. Either it's a separate part that's accurately matched to the body of the chuck, or it's integral with the chuck itself. In either case, the assumption is usually that the back plate is very accurate. It's just a static part. Now, the reason these are so popular is because they're so convenient. Three jaws tend to do a very good job of holding onto round stock, which is usually what you'd be doing on the lathe. But they also work well, of course, for hex stock. Square stock, not so good. And they have three interconnected jaws that move together when you turn the wrench. They open and close around a center axis. But with that convenience, there's usually a little bit of a compromise. The central axis that your jaws are clamping down on might not be the same axis that your spindle is rotating about. And on top of that, that axis of your three jaws very likely changes depending on what diameter you're working with. There's a mechanism in here that allows the jaws to open and close together with, you know, some tolerance. Now, granted, all three jaw chucks aren't created equal. You can buy very expensive, very accurate three jaw chucks. Some even allow you to make changes independently on all three of the jaws. But let me show you what I mean. Let me show you a practical example. This is a piece of precision ground stock. It actually may be like a chrome plated hydraulic shaft, but anyway, it's, it's very accurate. It's very round and dimensionally accurate. This is one and three quarter inches. 44-ish millimeters. Let's say I wanted to turn a feature onto this. I'm either starting with this or this is somebody else's part and they asked me to cut a groove or something in it. Let's put it in a three jaw chuck and see what happens. Now, I don't know if you were able to see that on video. I could see it standing here in front of the machine. That stock is out about five or six thou. And you could try banging it around with a hammer or opening the jaws, turning the stock a bit, closing them again, you know, basically playing around trying to reduce that as much as you can. Now, this isn't the freshest three jaw chuck in the world. For what I do, a chuck of this age, five thou, I consider that reasonable. And fact of the matter, that error will change depending on the diameter of your work. Again, there's tolerances in the mechanism that allow these three jaws to open and close. It might be dead nuts on something that's four inches in diameter, and it might be 15 thou out on something that's maybe a quarter of an inch in diameter. So what does that mean? Well, it depends on what you want to do. If you're cutting, just say, a groove for a spring clip, 5 thou might not be an issue. If you're cutting glands, for example, to take O-rings, maybe this is going to become a hydraulic cylinder. You may end up with 5 thou more compression on your O-ring on one side than you would on the other side, leading to premature failure. So there's our compromise. The three-jaw chuck is very convenient, but you can't just throw stock in there and expect it to be true. If, in this example, I needed to add features, and it was critical that those features are concentric with the outside of the stock, I would put this in a four jaw or a collet chuck. And a four jaw would allow you to adjust that five thou out so you're running true. But just with all things in life, there's caveats here. This problem is only happening because we're trying to maintain concentricity with the outside of the work. But say we weren't. Say we were just making a new bushing or pulley or something. Here's some aluminum stock. And for argument's sake, I want to accentuate the error in this chuck. I'm gonna push this stock off center. All right, that's kind of a lot, but let's assume our three jaw chuck was really bad. People often ask why I have all this equipment, what I make with it. Since quitting my day job in 2004, I've been making a killing selling miniature energy doms on eBay. 
Except for the poor chip evacuation, what you just watched should have come as no surprise. Even if the chuck is out, you can still make good parts. All three diameters are concentric to each other and their faces are perpendicular. Now, if this were the end of my part, like if the part was finished now and I just needed to maybe cut it off, all would be well. The problem comes when you need to flip a part to maybe machine the other end. Like in this case, you could flip it and face it and that would be fine. The face would remain perpendicular to the axis of the spindle. But if you were to flip this to try to do additional operations from the back, say to core out this energy dome, you'd be facing that five thou error we measured earlier. You would have to put it in a four jaw chuck or put it in a collet chuck after you flip this around, or I guess maybe before, in order to, let's put it that way. Unless of course, five thou isn't a big deal for the part that you're making. In the case of the energy dome, that would be a scrapped dome. This is also how you do eccentric turning. I mean, not in a three jaw, you'd probably want to dial it into some specific offset in a four jaw chuck. But you know, if you need to make a new camshaft for your car, this is how you might do it. What all this hot air boils down to in the end is repeatability. Let me say that again repeatability. If you can make your parts in a single setup, a three jaw is more than adequate. Even if it's old and worn out, I mean, as long as it doesn't let go of your stock and kill your buddy, they can still do good work. Now, if you need to remove your part, say to flip it or do another operation, maybe on the mill, unless you have a really good chuck, you'll have to mount it in a four jaw or similar, something that lets you tune that concentricity back in. If, of course, concentricity is important to you. When I was making these tool holders for the mill, I'm going on memory here, I roughed out and brought in the front end in a three jaw chuck. When I flipped these to cut the taper, I had to remove the three jaw, and in my case, I installed a collet chuck. Could have done it in a four jaw, but I have a collet chuck. That ensured that the taper was as concentric as my equipment could get it to the business end of the tool holder. Oh, and fun fact I should have mentioned earlier, but I forgot. If you haven't finished the work, and I don't know, maybe you need the machine to do something else. You can leave the work in the chuck and remove the work and the chuck together from the machine. Put on another chuck, do the other work you need to do, and then when you reinstall this chuck with the work in it, in theory, your work should be exactly where you left it. I don't know, maybe you lost track of time, you're about to miss your train. Just leave your work in the chuck, knock the chuck off the lathe, throw the whole thing in your backpack, and you can pick up right where you left off the next morning. Which takes me to the four jaw chuck. Everything I said till now still goes with the crucial difference that this doesn't have a self-centering mechanism. There's no scroll in this chuck. Now this is an independent four jaw, by the way. Self-centering four jaws do exist, and in that case, you'd be up against the same issues we just talked about with the three jaw. When I made this backplate, a lot of viewers asked how close I'd gotten the chuck in. Now, although this happens to be very close, it's not as critical here as it would have been on a three jaw. You see, these jaws can be independently adjusted to center your work perfectly every time. Now, I tried to get this as close as possible just because I don't want my lathe walking all over my garage every time I turn it on. But really, the chuck body isn't as critical here as it would be on a three jaw in terms of getting it centered on a back plate. So that's why earlier when I said if I could only pick one chuck, it would be the four jaw. It's just the most versatile. You can adjust it not only to be perfectly on center every time, but you can dial in offsets. You can remove the jaws, use some of these chucks as face plates. This one is small, doesn't happen to have T-slots in it, but they're extremely flexible. Though some folks are put off by their apparent hassle. But to be honest, once you get the knack of it, it doesn't really take all that long to set work up in a four jaw chuck. Last, in as far as the kit I have, there are collet chucks. Good collet chucks are really handy to have. They're extremely repeatable and can save a ton of time. I mean, you could put your part in, you could take your part out, you could turn your part around, you could do the hokey poke. Collets work on a completely different centering method than self-centering chucks. Collet chucks effectively transfer the taper from your headstock into a size that could accept a precision collet. So as you pull this collet into the headstock of the lathe, it tightens onto your work, centering it on the lathe axis. And again, really good collets are good at doing that. Here are three different styles of collets that I have. This is a Pratt Bernard, sometimes called a flex collet. You can see it's quite the contraption. I've got some 5C collets and a lot of ER32s and 16s. They all basically do the same thing. 
And the only downside to collet chucks is that they're really mostly suited to bar stock meaning stock of standard sizes, and really only to about a little more than an inch in diameter. If you have an odd sized part or something bigger than about an inch, there are some workarounds, but generally you likely won't use a collet chuck. Now these Pratt Bernard collets, again, this chuck came with a lathe. I don't know if I would buy this had I not already gotten it quote unquote for free. I mean, they're really nice. Each collet has a very big range, much more than a 5C or an ER collet. There's not as many collets to cover that big range. I think it's 12 collets to get up to, I don't know, an inch and three quarters probably, an inch and a half. They happen to be really good with hex stock, round and hex, though I've never seen these for square stock. You can get 5C for square stock. I don't think I've seen ER for square stock, but each system sort of has its pros and cons, its limitations. If I didn't get this Pratt Bernard with my lathe, I don't know, it's a tough call. I would probably get an ER32 or an ER40. I think 40 is the next size up. I really like collet chucks. When part size and geometry is right, you really can't beat them. And the ER system needs fewer collets than something like 5C. You can get the whole range up to an inch, I think in, I'm not sure, 12, maybe 15 collets. Whereas with the 5C, you need like 4,520. More precise, cheaper. Well, that's about all I think I had to say. You know, I really enjoyed our little chat in fits and starts over the past few days and edited together to make it seem like one seamless visit. Thanks for stopping by.